So um, my name is Dominic Hawkins. I'm based in Philadelphia, where we just had 12 inches of snow. So I'm appreciating all that Mardi Gras festivity with all your hats and envious of your weather at the moment. <laughs> um, so uh, tonight's presentation is really going to focus on, on mitigation for properties, specifically properties, not municipal, not municipal level overview um, for flooding. Um, I'm also going to add some information along the way that specifically deals with other um, related storm issues, including wind, um, although that's not really um, the primary focus of this. So um, Kim, who's on the phone, was kind enough to send me a couple of historic images of New Orleans flooding. Um, New Orleans has been flooding forever. This is Royal Street. And I don't remember which block, but it was in the email. And thank you, Kim. <laughs> so flooding in New Orleans has been something that has been, um, the citizens of the city have been dealing with for a really long time. Um, and it impacts quality of life because um, flooding obviously is, is disruptive in terms of being able to get around, but it can also be very detrimental to historic properties. Today, we still have flooding um, despite the levees. Um, and most of the flooding is really uh, as, uh, results from heavy storms. So hurricanes, tropical storms, um, sudden down, down bursts of rain can cause flooding in the city. And, and clearly it makes it difficult to get from point A to point B, but you also have to look as you're looking at these photographs, consider the water resting up against the edges of all of the buildings as well. Of course, New Orleans is on the water. The French Quarter, the Green Square is very much on the water. Um, and as we talked about the last time, historically, there were a lot of um, rivers and waterways that went from Lake Pontchartrain at the top that sort of snaked in through the city. So although some of those still remain in current day New Orleans, a lot of them have been filled in and land, I'll say acquired out of Lake Pontchartrain for additional development. So think about the ground as being pretty uh, soggy or, or not, um, oh, pardon me, oh, sorry. <laughs> think about the ground as being very permeable to water, meaning it's not really solid ground, it's man-made fill um, on top of which a lot of buildings are constructed. So the one of the programs, um, um, that, is, that was that assist people with flooding is the National Flood Insurance Program. Homeowners, homeowners policies, as I'm sure everyone in New Orleans knows, homeowners policies do not cover, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, there are people waiting. <laughs> um, homeowners policies do not cover uh, flooding. So if, if a property owner wants to be protected from flooding, um, they are required to purchase separate flood insurance. So the National Flood Insurance Program was established in um, 1968, recognizing that people were having trouble uh, recovering from floods. So the National Flood Insurance Program is a national program. Everyone pays into a central pool of money and whether or not that pool of money includes um, people from New Jersey or from Florida or from New Orleans or from Texas, um, everybody is operating off of the same flood insurance program. So it's the, same, it's the same pool of money. So with the increasing rate of storms that have been occurring, the National Flood Insurance um, Program has been paying out more and more money. So if you think about, you know, the Katrinas, the Harveys, the Irmas, the Michaels, the Sandys, all of these uh, property owners, all these damaged properties have required more money from the National Flood Insurance Program. So, um, which is causing some issues. So the National um, Flood Insurance Program, um, their goal is to really minimize the, the amount of money they're paying out. So they try to incentive, incentivize both community property owners to reduce the flood risk. One of the things that they do is they, they identify 
which properties have the greatest risk, and they charge them proportionally more money for flood insurance. And that's that's a map on a moment. So the National Flood Insurance um, Program has insurance limits. So for residential properties, it will insure the building for up to $250,000 and its contents for 100,000. And for commercial properties, 500,000 for the building and 500,000 for the contents. So this is an example of a flood insurance rate map, otherwise known as a firm. And because the city of New Orleans is protected by the levy, the, 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 the sort of beigey brown colors has this uh, diagonal gray hatching through it. So it, is, it operates under the assumption that, that the city of New Orleans, and specifically this is the French Quarter, um, has an, is an area with reduced flood risk due to the levy. So it's assuming that the levy is going to hold. Um, I think we can all recall instances when the levy didn't hold. You know, I, I uh, know that, that the Army Corps of Engineers has spent a, an incredible amount of money around the city to make sure that the levies are better um, in terms of operation. But it also presents, if you go back to this map, it's, it's this strange thing. So here we are looking at a city protected by a levy, but when it rains really heavily, as we saw in the previous photos, it floods. So what to do? So flood insurance is one of the great motivators um, for property owners to do something um, to repair or to improve their, their property's resilience to flooding. Because again, New Orleans has this levy, which is an unusual circumstance. They don't um, get all the benefits or, or they are not required to have flood insurance because they are not considered based upon this map to be at risk for flooding um, um, at the level required for flood insurance. The areas in blue, so these, these, these areas around along, I think it's Barrack Street, are the only areas that are noted as prone to flooding in New Orleans currently but the rest of the residents of the city are not required to have flood insurance or, or in, this, in this image, I should say. But yet flooding still happens. So some of um, what I'm going to be doing is talking about different levels and types of improvements that, that can mitigate or reduce the potential damage of flood water to buildings. So in, in thinking about mitigation options, um, there are a lot of things to consider and there's no one right answer. Every property is different and the circumstances um, around how you make the choice are different. So one is level of vulnerability. Is the property subject to six inches of flooding or six feet of flooding? What are you trying to, what are you trying to mitigate against? Another is the type of construction. Wood construction versus masonry or concrete. With wood construction, you're very limited in what you can do to prevent flood water from coming in. If you think about wood construction, it's basically either boards or shingles on, on uh, wood framing. So there's lots of places for water to seep in through holes and crevices. The type of foundation, is it a solid foundation? I know in New Orleans, you don't have basements, but you do have solid perimeter foundations. You also have piers. You also have slab on grade. The type of foundation will also dictate how easy it is to example, for example, lift a building. Is it residential or non-residential? So for residential property owners, you're actually limited on where you could benefit from flood insurance rates if you choose to buy flood insurance. If you're, even if you're not required, you can buy flood insurance but you're limited in the things you can do to, to achieve reduced flood insurance rates if you're residential. For non-residential properties, which, also, which includes um, everything from a commercial storefront to a church or a government building, you could um, um, do a lot more, you have a lot more options. 
What are the site constraints? A lot of buildings in the French Quarter are built right at the sidewalk. What does that mean? If you're gonna try and elevate that building that you see on the right, two feet, it is the equivalent of adding three additional steps to the front door. If you add three additional steps, you, you've eliminated the sidewalk. How do you make that work? How achievable is it? Is it something that you could just do relatively easily? Do you need a design professional, an architect or an engineer to help you? Can you um, maybe do something small or do a lot of small things and improve your resilience without having to spend a lot of money? And do you need manpower to implement what the change is or what the mitigation measure is? Some mitigation measures require that somebody be on site right before the flood starts to, to put in barriers so that flood water doesn't enter the building. You also have to think about what is the historic impact? You can do a lot of things, but a lot of the reasons that people go to the French Quarter is because of its historic charm and character. If you are changing buildings so radically that you lose that charm and character, is it still someplace you want to go or others will want to go? So it's this really delicate balance about, you know, you want to protect the building, you want to maintain the historic integrity, you want it to look as similar as possible, but still make sure the building's there in 50 years. So I'm going to start with some of the easy things. So these are things that people can just do. And although they might need a VCC permit, they won't necessarily need a building permit. So one of the ways to, to, to better protect your building is to get the water to flow away from the building. So you don't want water to be pushed up against the foundations of a building. Why? Because the water wicks or absorbs into what is typically a, a brick foundation or brick pier systems. And particularly the soft bricks in New Orleans, it could literally crumble the bricks. If it doesn't crumble the bricks, it will, it will inevitably um, melt the mortar. So the mortar actually um, becomes powdery and is no longer bonding the brick together. You also want to reduce the impervious surface coverage. I love New Orleans courtyards. They're magical, magical spaces, but every surface in them is paved normally. You very rarely have landscape areas. So if you can reduce the impervious surface coverage, you're absorbing more water into the ground, pushing less water out onto you know, the streets or into the, the sewer system and have less of a chance of backup in terms of increasing um, the water levels. Utilize native plants whenever possible. The simple reason is that native plants tend to um, tolerate existing weather conditions better. You don't have to add water or, or and so they won't, and they won't die out. <laughs> um, but they also tend to have root systems that will pull water down into the ground versus um, letting it pond on the top of the surface. And the last one is collecting stormwater to use for other things. So a few examples. So the, um, the uh, courtyard on the left has a lot of lush green foliage. It's wonderful and big trees. That helps to literally pull water down um, into, into the soil. On the right, it does have trees, but there's a lot more paved surface. And those little um, curbs around the trees actually prevent the water from getting to the base of those trees. So rain barrels is something that are becoming more common up this way. I've never seen one in New Orleans. Um, a rain barrel literally collects the rain water from the roof. It's a piece of furniture. So I'm assuming not subject to VCC review. Um, but it's a piece of furniture um, and in essence, and what it does is it allows the rainwater to collect into that barrel. And if you notice at the bottom of the barrel, there's a hose spigot and that's used to water the garden. So it's again, not putting more, it's, a, it's about minimizing the water that is going from the building into the storm sewage system. The one in the left is obviously prettier than the one in the right, but they come in lots of shapes and sizes. Building maintenance is really important. A poorly maintained building will not survive a flood. It will even do worse than the wind. Um, 
So making sure that the building is as tight as possible and that there are no openings in it um, and particularly paying attention to the foundation is key. Um, you also have as part of a basic improvement package is where the critical systems and equipment are. So if you think about anything that plugs into an electrical something, if that gets wet in a storm, um, it's a very costly repair. Another, another issue in storms, and this is gonna be controversial for the French Quarter, is secondary power sources. If you lose power, it's actually harder to recover. So how can we, how can we facilitate recovery after the flood? In addition, we should think about what are the materials that are being used that are subject to the flood water. So if we saw it, remember those earlier photos of the water in the street, um, you know, if that water is sitting, if you got two, you know, two to three inches of water sitting up against a building for an hour, what is that doing to those materials? So basic improvements, big thing is maintenance. Um, cleaning up the site, clean and taking care of the building will improve its ability to withstand the flood. If you look around the property, anything that is sitting on the ground that can become a projectile in the wind or can um, uh, be swept away by flood water and slam into a building is something that you want to get off your property. Building um, systems and equipment. So the, the option at the left is lovely. All the uh, mechanical equipment is hidden behind that little lattice uh, fence, you don't really see it, um, and it goes away. If that gets wet in the event of a storm, um, it's an extraordinarily costly replacement. And although the option to the right, not from New Orleans, may be extreme for what you would accept, I think starting to look at options that actually uh, take it above the ground level um, will help people recover um, um, in the event of a flood and be better in the long term. Also thinking about the inside of the house, pulling all your electrical injunction boxes up off the floor. Um, so usually most people have plugs in their baseboards or close to the, to the base of the buildings. Pull them up, you know, a couple feet off the floor. And yes, you'll have a dangling cord, but if you have any, literally any junction box or any connection that gets wet, you could blow out your electrical system and need to replace it. And it's also thinking um, about plumbing connections and make sure that everything is watertight that might get wet. Um, you could also plan for some flooding. So this example on the left is actually a basement in Pennsylvania. We get flooding um, and they have a sump pump to get the water out of the basement. Same property on the right, they know that this property floods regularly. So they have a system where they remove the baseboard um, and where you see the mop and they literally just push the water out that gets on the inside of the floor and, and it allows air circulation into the walls um, so they don't get mold buildup in the walls. <coughs> this is controversial. <laughs> the, the secondary power sources one, um, one of the best ones is honestly solar. And I know it's not permitted in the French Quarter, but it may be something to consider outside of the French Quarter. Having solar in place allows people to run fans and recover faster and also live in their house to a degree. You can have refrigeration, you can run tools, you can do you know, all the things that, that you want to do when you're trying to fix your house under the worst of circumstance when you have power. You can charge your cell phone. <laughs> Um, the example on the photo on the right actually shows a generator that's in Pennsylvania and that's kind of tucked back. Um, that's another option. The parcel size is pretty small in New Orleans, so I don't know how, how many properties, particularly in the quarter, can get um, have a generator installed. So here, in thinking about, as I said, materials and how they touch water, um, this is a this is a chain wall in the in the French Quarter. 
Um, the good news, having done the, the guidelines, I had a lot of pictures <laughs> to select from. So this wall, um, bricks are, are a pretty good material in terms of resilience to flood water. They're not such a good material when they have no mortar between them. In addition, this vent, which is really helpful when you're, when you're trying to get water out from inside of a foundation, um, this one happens to be covered with some sort of foil between the holes. So this one is totally ineffective. Um, so, so making sure that, that the materials that are touching the ground can actually withstand the flood water is pretty important. So it's not only, it's not only whether or not, um, whether or not if the brick sits in the water, it can withstand being saturated by water. It's whether or not, you know, something is, is traveling down the street and bangs into this foundation, is it structurally stable enough to hold itself up or is it gonna get punched through with the, you know, object because, because the bricks aren't tied together. So, and looking at sort of more, more extensive uh, mitigation options, building elevation is one of the um, most selected options for residential properties. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. So first of all, it's compliant with the National Flood Insurance um, Program um, and allows property owners to receive um, uh, flood re reductions in their flood insurance rate if it's successfully compl uh, um, completed. One of the challenges that most historic groups have with elevations is that most property owners want to elevate very, very high. Because usually what they're looking for is some form of, I'll say, bonus space under their house. Typically it's parking. And um, once you start elevating above a certain point, and there's no magic number as to what that point is, the house starts to look disconnected from the street. Um, and, and in terms of a historic context of the streetscape, it, it, it looks awkward as a kind word. <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I don't quite have the word to say, but, but it, you know, it starts to lollipop, meaning you'll have one up, one down, and, and um, it, it's very disruptive to the streetscape. Um, for, for a um, property to, an elevated property to meet um, the NFIP requirements, it, you have to limit what is happening below the, the, the lowest floor level. The lowest floor level in the case of New Orleans where you don't have basements is actually gonna be the first floor. So you can limit it um, to parking, storage, and then entrance. Coming back again, one of the challenges ends up being um, how you get to the front door. So you, every, every, fo every foot you go up, you basically have to add two steps um, to get to the front door. And because many of New Orleans' properties, the French Quarter's properties are on the property line, where are you putting those steps? So how are you accessing the, the building? Um, for people with disabilities who have trouble getting up steps, it makes that problem even worse. So if you are elevating, one of the other things you also want to consider is things like masonry items like chimneys. Usually, you know, as a character defining feature, you want those to, to be kept with the house, which means you're gonna to have to build a new base for them as you elevate. The other things you'll probably require are active uh, uh, perimeter flood um, vents and depending on how high you elevate, some sort of screening at the base of the building. So there's this, this is actually a book that was produced for FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, about, um, and this was produced post Katrina. So you, I, you could just Google this um, and come up with it, but it is a really good guide to the history of elevating in New Orleans. So, um, and it has some great historic images, which are probably in the historic New Orleans collection, but I'll just share the ones I found. And all of these images I've taken from this book. So, so I'm giving credit to them. 
Um, so this is Eberville Street. You can see the, so there's the flooding, but you can see the alligators in the water. And this, this is a house that was actually relocated in, in, uh, in 1955 and is now at Eleanor Street. And so they actually removed the lower level when they relocated it. Um, so the building on the left is a, is a noted French Quarter building, Madame, Madame John's Legacy, which was reconstructed and then raised on a basement after the fire of 1788. But it's also, it's not just small buildings or residential buildings. The women's, um, uh, the female ward of Charity Hospital was also moved. So moving buildings or lifting buildings is something that, that you know, is feasible, but has been done for over a hundred years. It's also very traditional in New Orleans to do it. So I'm going to focus much more or, or focus on elevating buildings because I don't think there's a lot of free parcels to be moving buildings around. So we'll focus on elevating. <coughs> So elevating a building starts with literally um, picking it up. So to pick it up, if you, if you notice in here, you can see steel with cribbing underneath. So, so steel is needled through the building um, um, below its structural floor and all the systems are disconnected from the ground or so any, anything that's coming up from below. So the plumbing, the electrical, um, you know, any internet connections, all the, all, the, all the stuff in and out sewer are all disconnected. And the building is literally um, raised and put on this cribbing, which is, which is these wood, uh, groups of wood um, structures to hold it up. Um, and then a new foundation is built underneath it um, to, the, to the designated height. And then the house is lowered down onto that foundation and then all the stuff is reconnected. Now, when thinking about <coughs> structures, um, the type of foundation that could be used for um, uh, flood compliance, it's actually extraordinarily limiting and not, not preservation friendly, I might, might add. So if you are going to be flood compliant, the two materials you can use for this new raised foundation are either poured concrete or um, concrete block that's filled um, with and includes reinforcing bars. Traditionally, most foundations in New Orleans are, are, are brick or stucco. You can certainly put stucco on either one of those. And some, some municipalities actually require brick veneer over uh, the foundation. So it looks more traditional. So how high, how high is enough? Depends on how low you are in the water. So the designation of BFE and DFE are base flood elevation and design flood elevation. What that basically means is, are you in the floodplain? And it's historically known as the 100 year floodplain. It's actually currently known as the special flood hazard um, area. So are you, are you within that? New Orleans is not because of the levee. And are you in a municipality that understands that conditions of flooding are getting worse? So they impose a higher standard, generally one to two feet above this base flood elevation, which is the design el flood elevation. And that's specific to municipalities and that lives under the, the floodplain ordinance. So if you look at the examples below, each of those properties is now compliant. So the property A did not require it to be elevated at all, but by the time you get to property D, it's significant elevation. So the higher you are, the less you have to change. So then it also comes down to a question about what is, what is the building sitting on? So, um, if the building has a, a slab, like many of the um, commercial buildings in New Orleans have a concrete slab floor, um, then uh, that's a more challenging building to, uh, to elevate. Not impossible, but it can be done. 
Um, if you are on, if you have perimeter walls or cross space, which is very typical of New Orleans buildings, then you can elevate the building again on the, on the concrete blocks or the poured concrete. But one of the things you have to do is establish flood openings on, on at least two sides of the building that let the water go in and out in a way that it doesn't collapse the foundation. You can also do similar things on um, with basements, but you have to fill in the basement. I know it's not applicable. And then there's um, open foundations or columns and piers or piles, which are um, not typical of the French Quarter, so won't spend any time on them. So um, flood vents. So if you look at the building on the left, it actually has two vents. I'm, I'm guessing, I don't recall them specifically, I'm guessing the oval one is the pretty one. Um, and it has no function, whereas somebody put the, the, the rectangular one in later, and hopefully that does function. Um, as I stated before, the one on the right, which is filled with concrete or something, <laughs> or cementitious mix, um, if, it's, if it's filled in, it doesn't work. So it's not, it's not uh, doing its job. And if it's filled in, what the, what the concern is, is as the water rises, um, the pressure of the water can literally collapse the foundation in. So you want the water to be going in and out at equal um, speeds so that the foundation does not collapse. Um, another question with mitigation uh, or elevation is how big is your lot? Again, the closer you are to the street, the harder it is to get to your front door. Um, um, because you have to add more steps. So what I, this is, these uh, diagrams are actually from the guide I wrote for the state of New Jersey and I'll provide a web link at the end. But I looked at um, elevating a building throughout the guide, either two foot four, four foot eight and seven foot oh, just to get a range of looking at the same prop, the same sort of height variation at different properties. And as you can see, the tighter it gets to the sidewalk, it's really, really hard to get all the stairs to allow you to get um, in the front door. So stairs, stairs, stairs. <laughs> so this, gives, this just gives you a sense of, of sort of different configurations you can use. When you are trying to elevate a building, it's ideal if you can maintain the access to the front door that was the historic access. So this is again from that history of, of elevating buildings in New Orleans book, but that front center line access, if that's the way it was historically, then that's you know, hopefully what you're able to maintain. Um, but closer you are to the sidewalk, that's, that's harder and harder to do. So I'm not going to speak to whether these are good examples or bad examples, these are examples um, that are, that are uh, you know, local to New Orleans buildings. So elevations that are relatively low um, are easier to um, visually screen at the foundations. You want to be able to, again, uh, be able to get the stairs, hopefully in the same orientation that, that um, they were historically. Um, you don't want to be looking underneath the building to the extent you can put foliage in um, and cover the screening, that's better. Sometimes you actually have to introduce for the first time handrails on porches because you're elevating to an extent that requires that the handrails are, are required for building codes. So if you're either adding handrails or extending handrails, you want those handrails to be sensitive to the um, style of the building, the type and style of the building. So, um, there are a lot of, I'll say, small details to work out to make sure that visually um, it looks like a whole building instead of uh, two separate buildings. So I'm going to show you just, these are sketches that I did, and these are, this is again for the New Jersey guide, but it will give you a sense of, of how a building can change based upon its elevation. So this is an arts and crafts bungalow placed relatively close to the street. So the building on the left is the one that's changing. The building on the right is just there for reference. So if you look on the left-hand side of the building, there are flood vents on the side, preferably, um, <coughs> except for New Orleans. I don't know any um, city that I 
you know, I'll say this, the style of building in New Orleans a lot or celebrates its flood vents. Up on the East Coast, we try and hide them. <laughs> um, they're not typical of the hist uh, historic ar architecture. So the flood vents are on the side. And as we're elevating the building on the left, we're starting, you know, I, the, the, the steps are getting recessed into the porch so we can meet the sidewalk. And by the time we go up to seven feet, um, I added this perimeter wall because it visually gives the building a base, even though it, um, even though it, you're still elevating that full seven, that full seven feet. So visually, it, it, it is more connected to the ground, at least in my opinion. There are lots of ways to solve the problem. This is just an example of, of how I thought it could work. Um, so in the case of New Orleans, or in, in the French Quarter, where you have lots of attached buildings, you can't elevate unless all your neighbors want to. And that's, that's a hard sell. So this is an example I did in Baltimore where I looked at, okay, you have attached buildings, but maybe it's flooding only sort of six inches inside my house. How, what can I do that doesn't require me to elevate the building? One of the things you can do, and one of the great things New Orleans has is really tall ceilings. You can literally do an overbuild on your first floor, sort of the gray area on the first floor and raise your floor height um, has zero impact on the outside of the building um, and still be able to have a full first floor and, and any living floors above. Um, it's great, except you also have to, you know, most people have their kitchens, et cetera. It's, it can be very expensive to make this happen. You also have to let the water in and out of the building. So the, you have to put flood vents at the front and back of the building to allow the water to flow through. Um, wet, wet flood proofing is literally saying water can flow in and out of the building at will. And at will is really key element. So it has to be able to, even if nobody's there in the middle of the night, the water has to be able to get in and get out on its own. So wet flood proofing is actually compliant for residential structures. It assumes um, the water will go in and out as it, as it rises and falls, again, to prevent the walls from collapsing. Um, it requires that the walls be structurally sound and really, really watertight. So think about every crevice and hole in the wall, not only the cracks you see, but the little, the little openings and cracks around windows and doors and, and faucet, you know, um, hose bibs and all the rest of it. All those little cracks have to be filled in. It also requires the floor be pretty waterproof as well. Um, so, um, so wet flood proofing only allows uses of parking entrance and storage at the ground floor for residential. Uh, for commercial buildings, you can have a restaurant, but you might have to be um, put materials in it that are, that are flood friendly that you can hose down in the event of a flood. So this is a wet flood proofed house in Baltimore. <clears throat> so the front door, the, the build, you can see the building on the right and then the, the other two photos are details along the, along the front and the back of the building. So the first floor of this house is used for storage and parking. If you look at the photo in the rear, you can see the two parking bays. Um, on the front, you see the two basement windows. They've actually infilled the basement with gravel so it prevents the walls from collapsing in and um, water can come in and out the front. And so they still have a front door on the street, but it has minimal change. You wouldn't know what was going on in the back. This happened to be a house where they, um, uh, the, the building was substantially damaged. So they basically just retained the facade and built the, the new back on it. If you think about wet flood proofing in terms of the French Quarter, you know, you have certain challenges. So this is a um, Crail townhouse. And if you were to try and wet flood proof this, you would basically lose your, your two first floor rooms and, and the um, whatever's in the service L as well. And you would have to put flood vents through everything to let all the water flow through. You could retain it for parking and storage, however, um, but it's a, it's, it's a very big loss of space. 
unless you can, you can uh, raise the interior floor heights to um, be able to get above the flood level. So you have to look at all of the, all of the um, inlets for water and make sure that it can flow both in and out. So that also includes all the carriageways as well as the passageways. Dry flood proofing, and this is specifically not compliant for a national flood insurance benefit, but it could be a really good option for commercial buildings, particularly those that are in a, a townhouse um, setting or meaning um, adjoining um, uh, party walls. So water, think about putting a wetsuit around the perimeter of your building. You want no water to get in, that's the goal. Um, so again, you have to fill all your cracks and voids. You have to make sure you're very waterproof at the base of the building. And all of the windows and door openings where you could get water in, that includes under storefront windows, you have to put a barrier to keep the water out. You also have to be realistic and know that some water is going to get in. Um, and, and how you deal with that, it, you, you have to deal with that through things like sump pumps to get the seepage out. So um, putting barriers up, meaning infilling, infilling um, window openings, for example, on the left, this is in Baltimore again, is one option. Again, not the preservation friendly option, but it's an option. Temporary, you can also do um, sandbags sometimes. They're not so temporary, but that's, that's considered a dry flood proofing um, method. If the door is not tight, it's not going to work. So I'm saying that here, but here's, here's another option. So these are um, flood gates. So the channels that are flanking the window and the door opening, um, uh, just before the flood, somebody has to run down to the basement and grab these gates and then put them in the right order in the right opening so that they seal. So they also, they have all these gaskets and um, seals along the edges to try and keep the water out. So um, the example on the left is actually um, one in Philadelphia and they have actually put their their flood gate on the inside of their restaurant door. So you don't see it from the outside. So these things do not have to be installed on the outside face. On the right hand side is an example of, of a shorter flood gate that you can use, um, for example, at a residential property, which includes, which requires you to put a channel in the jam, uh, on the jam as well as into the sill. And it's, those are generally limited to maybe about two to three feet of water, depends on how they're made and how well they're connected. But again, there will be seepage and it's not um, national flood insurance program compliant for residential buildings, but if you keep your house dry, then maybe it's an okay thing. So if you look at something like a storefront, so a storefront window, um, this one has an alcove. Um, if you get flood water, you can also use these to block the, the entrance to the storefront. So that's a way to, to keep the water out. You are gonna get seepage, but you could you know, keep the worst of it um, out of the store. So those are the flood mitigation options and I'm happy to answer any questions um, anyone might have. Nothing? <laughs> Come on guys, I raced to finish so there was 10 minutes left. <laughs> If you're nervous about unmuting or talking, you can always submit it via chat. So I will I will say since since we're waiting for some people to to enter, some of this some of the things I, I talked about are not necessarily approved by the VCC under their current guidelines, <laughs> as I am acutely aware. Um, so uh, and I'm not I'm not a proponent of or not a proponent of changing the guidelines. I'm just I'm I I'm stating that these are options and they may be applicable in the greater New Orleans, if not in the French Quarter. 
I would, I have a request actually. So we have some people from the HDLC on here and they deal with houses that have um, piers and piles. If you could just talk a little bit about the water moving through those foundations, I think it might help some of the HDLC folks. So the, the piers are actually, it's, it's one of the yeah, so the so piers can actually be raised. So um, it it just has to be either the concrete or the concrete block in terms of raising it, and you can dress it in any way you want. But one of the things that you have to do is anything going on underneath the house has to be flood compliant. So you don't want to be running all your your um, uh, HVAC equipment, all your ducts and things underneath the house because if they got flooded, um, it, it will destroy them. So in terms of the visual applications, you can, you can encase the piers in brick. You can actually, um, one of the examples I saw in Maryland, they actually use colored concrete instead of beige concrete. So it was colored red. So it, it blended a little bit better. Encourage people to actually plant things around their foundations when they have enough space to do so. And also put lattice in, particularly as you get higher up, you do not want to be looking under people's um, foundations. It's not really pretty. <laughs> Thank you. And then we do have a question in the chat. Um, Jeff would like to know in the French Quarter, what type of foundations are most frequently used on the historic building? I don't know if you know the answer to that or if we might have to phone Brian in. <laughs> um, I, would, I would guess for the commercial buildings, it's generally slab on grade. Um, for the shotguns, it's generally um, um, a chain wall on the front and then piers on the sides, all of which can be raised. That sounds right to me. I hope that helped Jeff. I hope to say a word. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Dominique, this is Deborah Goldstein with HDLC. Um, you talked about alternative energy sources for after an event. Um, what do you think about configurations of solar panels and locations of and um, generators and also battery backup for the solar panels? Well, I mean, the general rule of thumb, first of all, it's written in your guidelines, I know, <laughs> but the general rule of thumb is you want solar panels to be as close as possible to the roof surface, parallel to the roof surface. Um, generally about, I, I, I generally recommend about 12 inches off the ridge line and off the eave and off the, um, off any hips. So just keep them slightly off. And to the extent you can get the same color or a similar color of panel to the roof surface and get them without um, a colored band around the outside. So some of them come with a silver band with a black um, um, solar panel. If you, can get it, if you can get it all black, it visually goes away better or all brown, they come in different colors. No, I understand that. I was just wondering if you had sort of unmuted oh, wow. your, um or not your, but the HGLC guidelines for those kinds of things based on what you're seeing with water rising. So I updated the HGLC guidelines in January 19, I think. So that, that is the most reflective of the current approval process at the HGLC. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? We've got her for six more minutes. <laughs> I don't know if you heard my dog barking, but. <laughs> well, if anybody doesn't have any questions, then we'll let everyone get to their dinner and their dogs. No, Tony's question? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh. Sorry. Elliot, did you have a question? Nope, I'm good. Okay. Oh, well, I, you know, I have a question. I was reading, you know, the, actually that book that you've got that you were showing and it's, you know, these interesting diagrams of allowing a flood to flow through the building and having, you know, having had a building that flooded in Katrina, um, I, you know, I, I, 
looked at those diagrams with a little chagrin because the water in the drawings is very pretty and blue and clean. But <laughs> the, the reality is disgusting and a horror show of sewage and chemicals and all of that. So how do you, you know, compensate, you know, advising people to do, do something to where you're going to allow the flood go through your building on, and I'm not saying there's an alternative, but so I was just saying, how do you respond to the reality of a flood? It's Brian, Brian, I might answer yeah. with just a little bit of experience that I've had is that, um, for instance, the steamboat houses um, are have all tile ground floors. And so like on, up onto the walls and so that they were really easily pretty much hosed out. Um, you know, so that's a historic example of how that was handled. So um, one of the guides I, I prepared is actually for my um, my office, meaning the historic district my office sits in. And it's a mill community along the water in Philadelphia. And there's a restaurant that floods. I mean, it just floods all the time. And they literally replaced um, all their furniture, like all, all the movable furniture is aluminum, hose it down. The floors are concrete. They built a banquette concrete. They built a bar concrete. <laughs> I mean, they literally, they, and they put all of the kitchen equipment on wheels. So um, the stoves, the refrigerator, everything's in wheels. So they literally have quick releases on all their gas lines, roll all their equipment out um, and take the cushions off the chairs and, you know, clo close up and call it a day and put it all back. No, I, I actually stayed in a hotel in Mexico that was on the coast that way. It was all made of concrete. You know, the, the, every, the bedding was all concrete with, you know, mattresses on top. And I can imagine. <laughs> that sounds harsh, man. <laughs> but I'm just saying, you know, in New Orleans where you've got these, you know, interiors where, you know, we don't have basements and, you know, this is, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing to try to make people understand when it, it hasn't been built from the ground up for that. Right. So there's also one of the things that I have, I have heard someone propose, haven't, or, or to, I've heard somebody propose, but I also know somebody who partially did it, is they literally put hooks in their ceilings um, in their house. And when they know it's gonna flood, they, they rig all their furniture up to pulleys and they pull it up. Cool. She's in New Jersey. Cool. So it's, you know, it's, you can get creative. <laughs> Um, but that's the choice she wanted to stay in this house. And that was the choice she made. She, you know, she wanted her puffy furniture that, that doesn't fare well in the water. The other thing I, I neglected to mention is the park service guidelines on um, a flood, flood mitigation are coming out supposedly in March or February, March. So I would also check in in the park service to see um, um, when those get posted, they're supposed to have graphics in them, which will be terrific. As a resource. All right, guys, I'm missing New Orleans. I'm missing all of you. And it sounds like we have no more questions. It's not in the chat either. So thank you so much for doing this for us. We appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure. All right, guys. Well, I look forward to my next trip down. <laughs> we can't wait to have you. All right. Happy Mardi Gras. Thank <laughs> joining thank everyone. Thank you, Dominique. Happy to have you. Thank you.